So we're uh, delighted to have Dr. Marcia Griffin here. Uh, she's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Texas of the Rio Grande Valley and director of the Division of Child and Family Health. Um, she's also the director of the Community for Children, and this is an organization that prepares future physicians to provide compassionate, effective leadership within community collaborations. That sounds very much like our core values, doesn't it, Martha? I mean, uh, the three C's. I'm not going to ask all of you to repeat those, but I know you know them, but those are our core values at, at Children's. So to provide compassionate, effective leadership within community collaboration. And Community for Children has hosted pediatric residents from Children's National for elective rotations. Are there, is there anybody here? I know you were down there as a nurse on the, uh, in, in the clinic. Are there any of the other, is there anybody else here? They're, they're probably serving and, and, and working uh, somewhere. So, Marsha, we have some work to do. Okay. Looks like we have some people here that need to come work with you. Uh, she received her medical degree from the UT University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio in 2003 and completed her residency in pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine and UT San Antonio in 2006. So a lot of Texas, right? A lot. A lot of Texas. Okay. But before beginning her medical career, Dr. Griffin studied the theology of social justice at United Theological Seminary in New Brighton, Minnesota. And she was also the founder and executive director of the Focus Foundation, a nonprofit that produced documentary films about adolescents and their effort at success. And perhaps some of you have seen those documentaries. From 1996 to 1999, she was the Director of Housing Services for the Central Community Housing Trust in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she successfully worked on housing services for Somali refugees, inner city homeless, former addicts, and street children. Over the past two years, you may have read her editorials in many national newspapers and seen her on national news outlets including the Rachel Maddow Show. Does anybody watch MSNBC in this, in this crowd? Not enough. No, I didn't say that. And, and Anderson Cooper 360 on CNN. Anybody watch CNN? Lots of kids. So speaking about the health of immigrant children and families seeking asylum in this country. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2012 AAP Local Heroes Award, the 2015 AAP Special Achievement Award, AAP is uh, the Academy of, of Pediatrics, the 2015 Texas Pediatric Society Central American Refugee Humanitarian Award, and the 2018 AAP Clifford Blue Lee Award. And this award is given to members for outstanding service to the Academy. So you can see that uh, she is really uh, getting recognized for her great work and contributions uh, 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 for these children and, and families and for our society. At that ceremony, she was praised for her work caring for the immigrant and migrant children. I really want a, a special shout out to uh, Drs. Dooley, Falusi, and Chapman, otherwise known as Danielle, Lonre, and Jennifer, <laughs> uh, for putting uh, this together and applying for the AAP Rome Visiting Professorship. So this is a, a grant that they applied for. They had the, the, um, the strategy uh, to put forward this grant, and it was a competitive situation, and the grant was funded by the National AAP so that then we could bring Dr. Griffin here. So that really uh, is the kind of leadership uh, we love here at Children's National, that you all would do that, and you competed and were able to get the grant that then supports uh, having a visiting professor of this stature at Children's National. And that's who we are at Children's National. We're committed to serving all of the children in our uh, community, and I emphasize the word all. Uh, and so we're honored to have Dr. Griffin, who is a champion of this mission, 
here to speak with us today. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I am really just a megaphone from the border. I'm not an expert in anything, um, but I, um, the awards go to the kids and the families and the families that you see on the wards and in the schools and in your clinics. So I am going to be speaking about um, the immigration broken system that we have, but I'm going to only be talking about it from my experience and telling my stories from the front lines of what I see. It is a terribly um, political um, hot potato, and it's difficult to talk with without people getting um, on one side or the other. And I would like us to think not that way, but that they're all of our children, and we're committed to all children. And so it's about the children. And so once they're here, uh, I feel like we need to be committed to giving them the best that we can. Uh, so it is a pleasure to be here uh, and see all of you. I also want to do a shout out to Dr. Natalie Keown, who was part of the team putting all this together. And she and Dr. Dooley came down a year ago to visit me at the border to really start this conversation of how we can begin to partner together. I have no relevant financials except that I have this huge student loan since I went to school so late. And I'll start a GoFundMe page and if anybody wants to go there. So we're going to be talking about the growing magnitude of migration. Hopefully by the end of this you'll be able to explain that yourself. Uh, the experience, I'm going to be talking a lot about the experiences of the immigrant children at the border. Initiatives across the country. Uh, to support these families, which will really warm your heart and give you some positive things to live to leave with, and talk about opportunities for collaboration that we're doing with other institutions and across the country. So we're going to be talking about all of that. Uh, this is a uh, I, all of my speeches are made in honor of the Community for Children participants, and we have one sitting right down here in front, Dr. Hanicio Guzman Medina, who is usually in Oklahoma, that uh, surprised me, and he's up here doing an ID month uh, up here with you. Can I just say, shout it out for Hanicio. He's great. If he wants to be here, you should grab him up. <laughs> yeah, he's fabulous. <laughs> he's a huge advocate, a huge advocate for kids. So Community for Children, I started um, during residency and brought it to the border. And it is, a, uh, it is an elective in uh, professional leadership um, based really on the bedrock of social justice and from the perspective of the poor. Uh, so we bring them down for a month and they are embedded in the community working with the organizations that are working in our community and in our community on the border, that invariably means that you're working with immigrants. So they're working with immigrants and seeing the issues, but they're also seeing housing issues and women's issues and children's issues and working with attorneys and learning that attorneys are really our, our colleagues and friends and uh, to reach out to them for assistance as they reach out to us. So migrating children around the globe, I don't need to tell you, you're right here in D.C., so you see a lot of this coming and going. But there are, uh, according to UNICEF in 2017, over 238 million people who are living outside of the place that they were born. 30 million of those are children who are living somewhere else besides where they were born. That could be people here in D.C. It could be people that chose to live in Europe. It doesn't mean immigrants. Of that, there are approximately 20 million refugees that have had to flee their country and 10 million of those are children who have had to flee their country. So some of those are fleeing their countries and coming across the southern border. It is not an easy issue to attack, um, given the uh, global climate change and uh, political unrest across the country. I don't think this issue is going to go away. So it's, I think, imperative on us to learn this issue and learn how to take care of children of immigrants who are in our communities and be able to support them 
and know their history. Uh, so the front lines are coming to a neighborhood near you. I get a lot of calls all the time from people that want to come down to the border and help, which is great, especially last summer when the news was all about separation of children. And really, it's, uh, there were so many people coming down, it was very difficult to manage and orient them and have it be meaningful for either the immigrant families or the people coming. And so I said, they're coming to you. The families are coming across and they're staying with us 24 to 48 hours where I see them, where you can interact with them. Uh, and so they, but they're spreading across the country. So they're coming to you. So I put together a few numbers of how many are in the DC area. And they also, um, I'm going to be giving Brent and Brown tomorrow in Virginia, so I have some of those numbers, but I didn't do that, so I apologize. So here in the District of Columbia, there are 95,000 immigrants, as reported in the American Immigration Council in 2015. Um, how many live here? Someone told me 600,000. So that's a big number of immigrants, and 4,218 are children. So those are probably all the people that are wanting to come into your clinic and you're needing to be in the hospital. 25,000 of those are undocumented immigrants. 10,000 U.S. citizens here are living with an undocumented, and 7,500 of those are U.S. citizen children living with an undocumented parent. This can be uh, very um, nerve-wracking and fear-inducing to not know if somebody in your family is going to be taken away or picked up somewhere or there's an ice raid. And ice raids are happening uh, a lot in the interior of the United States, not just on the border. Uh, this is something that the ACLU put together. I have a, uh, I don't know what you call it. It's a, um, when you say, okay, I should tell you that I have, it's not a conflict, a disclosure or disclaimer. Uh, my husband works for the ACLU. He's the border strategist, the border advocacy strategist for the national ACLU. Um, so sometimes people, sometimes people will ask me if I know the ACLU, if I'm working with the ACLU, and I say, well, I work with the ACLU. <laughs> talk to some information that's going on. So between the two of us, the media are always at our side yard or calling us to get some kind of information. So I rely on Mike for a lot of that. Uh, they put together this because uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, ICE and Border Patrol, considered they have this rule called the 100 mile zone rule, the border zone. 200 million people live in this zone. And if you'll see, all of the District of Columbia, Massachusetts, Connecticut, a lot of complete states here in the Northeast are within that 100-mile zone. That zone, and you see it's, uh, so I live, um, well, I'm in, this is where I live, right here. Okay, you'll see a slide in a minute. Um, so the Department of Homeland Security and the Border Patrol have more lax rules in those zones than in the other part of the country. They can enter your house without a warrant. You know, they can do things that, uh, in fact, the uh, legal aid uh, arm in our uh, neck of the woods says it's the non-constitutional zone of Texas. So they don't have the same rights as they do in other parts. So the things I tell you about today that are happening on the border could happen in your neighborhood as well. You never thought you would see ice raids in your neighborhood, but they're going on. So I think it's really important for us to be vigilant about what's going on in our community and be able to be uh, a protection and safety and at least be able to support our families who are afraid of this. Um, so I did put together some numbers for you. In D.C., immigrant families produce after taxes contributed to your economy, $2.9 billion. This also comes from the American Immigration Council. 50.7% um, of all businesses in the D.C. area, includes Maryland and Virginia, 
are led by immigrants. So they're contributing a lot. They're hiring lots of workers. So they contribute and pay taxes in your district. In Virginia, they contribute in all of Virginia, $27. billion after tax to the economy of Virginia. One million immigrants are in Virginia, 69,000 uh, children are immigrants in Virginia. 300,000 are undocumented. 400,000 of those have somebody in their family that's undocumented. And of those, almost 100,000 are U.S. Uh, citizen children with an undocumented parent. Um, so this is your neighborhood, too. It's not just me on the border. Let me just say it is not illegal to come to our border and seek asylum. It's part of the Refugee Act. It's an international law. We signed off on it several times. And so it's part of our international law that we follow that people can come to our border and apply for asylum. The problem right now, and that has happened for years and years, the problem recently in the last few years is they, they do what's called metering. And so the Border Patrol quit allowing people to seek asylum. They would turn them away from the border. The only legal uh, port of entry in our region is across the board, across the bridges. They're about 250 to uh, maybe 200, well, I would say a quarter mile to a half a mile long. And so they walk across the bridges and apply for asylum when they get to our side. Um, the Border Patrol, uh, because the people were coming across and they were applying um, at the border, ACLU was on the bridges, and uh, when they came across, right in the middle of the bridge is kind of the river, kind of, sort of. So uh, when they they came over and applied, like if I'm if I'm U.S. and here's Mexico over here, and I am walking across with my family. Once I get to this customs office, I'm on U.S. soil and I'm asking for asylum, they have to accept me in. They can do what they will with me, but they have to accept me in. So what happened is they got, the Border Patrol got a little, uh, changed their tactics, and now they moved this office because they got a lawsuit that, you know, they were turning away people when they couldn't because they were on U.S. soil. So they moved a, a stopping point in the middle of the bridge. So the families are backed up on that side of the bridge. Uh, last Friday, uh, before I left to come up here, there were 200, over 200 people, that's women and children and fathers and children, on the bridge. They're all families. If an individual comes across, they're automatically deported. They're not accepting it. It's very, very rare. So the ones that are coming right now are families with children or unaccompanied children. This is where I live. This is the migrating children coming into this country. So you can see where the arrow is. Uh, Hanisio has been down there and worked with me for a month, about a year ago. And um, so you can see, if you're coming from Central America, the shortest route to the United States is right through my area, not up in uh, San Diego, not in uh, Arizona. They're coming across all of those, but for the last 10 years and now, um, this past year, 2018, 90,000 families or individuals in a family, so 90,000 people total, came across the southern border. 45,000 unaccompanied children came across the southern border. And because of our location, 67 percent, Mas o menos, it goes up like 66, 70 percent, 67 percent come across our region. They go into our Border Patrol Processing Center, the Rio Grande Valley Sector Processing Center, which is considered the worst in the country and has been lawsuits against it. They have uh, fought this in the Flores Agreement um, about the conditions within those. Uh, so uh, talking about some of the trauma that they go through on the way up, it, there are push factors that are pushing these families out of their country. So many of them have family members that were killed or kidnapped. They've had a family member raped or they've been threatened. They've witnessed assassinations. They've been, uh, gangs have tried to force them to come and be their assassins. 
or work for them, uh, girls will be um, uh, enticed or they will be forced to come in and be their girlfriends. Um, there's a lot of domestic, domestic violence that goes on. When you have this kind of violence in a community, it spills over or armed conflict. So this is in, I'm talking about predominantly 97% of the immigrants that come across my region are from Central America. We have Brazilians, we have some Nicaraguans, not as many, um, but mainly they're El Salvadorians, Guatemalans, and Honduras. Uh, Mexico is they're immediately turned back, they're flipped back, they're a uh, contiguous country so that we don't have to let them in. So even unaccompanied children are immediately flipped, they call it flipping, back to Matamoros or Reynosa, which are the two big cities in my area. Um, now I talked to Mike uh, this morning and he was lamenting the fact that he had a Mexican family from Valle Hermoso, which is nearby us, who had been threatened by the gangs and uh, the father and his wife and a baby was trying to get out of Valle Hermoso, which is about an hour and a half from uh, the border. And uh, they were hiding at the bridge trying to get across. And Mike asked them, um, did you, did you have to leave and did you leave something scary? And they, the young man looked around and looked around to see if somebody was near him and then told Mike his story. He was like, I'm scared to be here because they're going to follow me. If they find me, they will kill us. So these stories are real. They're the stories of your families here in D.C. Uh, violent death rates in these countries are this high. El Salvador is second only to Syria. Honduras is below Syria, but just above Afghanistan. Guatemala is worse in violent death than Yemen. So this is how violent these places are. So when they say they have fled violence, they are fleeing horrendous violence that we can't imagine. So during their trip, they've left and they're on their way. Many of them experience violence on the way. Uh, some of them are kidnapped. Some of them are raped. Uh, they're extorted. They're all extorted when they get to the border because the uh, gangs own the uh, river. And so to get across the river, so if, I, so if I'm trying to go across the bridge and every day the Border Patrol says, go away, go away, go away, and since now they're in the middle of the river and you haven't put uh, down on U.S. soil, it's uh, Mexico's fault and Mexico's problem. So they say, go away, go away. Well, our region is one of the most dangerous in Mexico uh, because of the gang violence. So they own the river, they own the towns, we don't go out at night. Our region in 2009 and previous, because I've lived down there off and on for 30 years, we used to cross that bridge. That bridge was open. You didn't have to have passports, you didn't have to have visas. I went over there and had dinner, met family and friends over there, spent the night with them in colonias, and uh, they came over and shopped, and kids went to school on either side. We had parades that went across the bridge. It was completely open border with vibrant economy on both sides. That ended with 9-11 and all the processes they put in. So families got divided. So grandmother may be still in Mexico and the kids are over here. They have a baby that grandmother doesn't get to hold them, doesn't get to help the new mom, neither does the mother. So families have been separated in our region. So this is the migration trauma, uh, much the same. Many people drown in the river crossing and many people die on the trip uh, that are coming through the desert. So some try. They normally come across, if they're with children, they come across and they turn themselves into Border Patrol. So they wait on the side of the river to turn themselves in and ask for asylum. However, if you don't come across the bridges, then you're considered illegal. You came illegally, so now you're a criminal. That crime is a misdemeanor. Um, in 2017, doctors with Border documented what they were seeing. They've been in Mexico since 2012, and they documented all the horrendous violence and uh, abuse these um, 
the fleeing immigrants have suffered on the way. So this is by the Women's Refugee Commission uh, leaders, which is Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services, and KIND published this, which is a wonderful thing to see, to see them say. It's a neglected humanitarian crisis, and what they were seeing that the families were suffering was as, as bad as any other war-torn country where they are. But they're still fleeing. They walk. They may walk for weeks and weeks. They come on trains. This is La Bestia. This is a very dangerous way to come because you're not riding inside the train. You're riding on top of the train. So parents will sometimes tie their kids to the top of the train so they don't fall off while they fall asleep. So uh, people fall off. They have legs uh, amputated. They lose their lives coming on the train. And the gangs also target the trains and come and pull people off and kidnap them. Uh, this is how some of them come, packed in a van. And um, you will see that this is by Veronica Cardenas, and Veronica is, Vero is a, a fine photographer. She's now exhibiting across, across the country at the UN and in Europe. Uh, she lives in our area. She has documented, um, you know, folks uh, from the AAP when they come to the, the valley. But she went on the trip with, uh, to come from Central America last, uh, last year and took these photos and gave me permission to use these photos. You notice that they don't look like they're going to Disney. They also don't look like criminals or rapists. These are families coming, and it's a scary journey. It's a long journey. They sell everything they have or mortgage it to be able to pay for the journey to get here because they have to pay bribes and pay off the game. So it is a very scary journey. You'll also notice that they have no seatbelts. And so I'll tell you one story of uh, a woman named Araceli. Araceli um, was from Central America. She came across in late 2017. And Araceli had been raped in her country by the gang. She had gotten away. She had been abused for years by her husband. She had several kids that were older, but she had a 10-year-old. Uh, at that time, it was a 9-year-old daughter. She finally fled. She came in a van like this, got all the way to the border. She got to Reynoka, which is uh, our sister city on the other side of McAllen, which is about an hour from me. And before they got into the city, the van flipped, and everyone was thrown out, including Adeseli's little girl who was killed. Adeseli uh, had a fractured pelvis, humerus, her right, uh, I mean, femur, her right humerus was fractured. She had clavicle fractures and multiple lacerations. She was put in the hospital in Mexico, got very good care, and they put her back together with pins and plates and set her out free. She went from there on a walker to a shelter run by nuns in Reynosa, and uh, she was going to walk across the bridge. So she stayed at the shelter one night, uh, and then she got to the bridge. She walked across that bridge with her walker, Got, this is before they put him in the middle of the bridge. He got to the border, asked for asylum, and the Border Patrol asked her to have a seat and wait, and she would have to wait. At the end, of, so she waited all day. Uh, at the end of the day, they said, go back. We don't know if we'll take anybody tomorrow. Go to another bridge, but go away. So she walked back across the bridge. When she got to the bottom of the bridge, she was kidnapped by the cartel. She was raped again. She was abused again. She came up with money to get to, from her family in Central America to pay the gangs, and somehow, miraculously, she was released. She was released. She went back to the shelter. So by this time, she is not as well as she was before, having gone through that. But when she got to the shelter this time, she was uh, engaged by one of the most famous um, and infamous human rights workers on the border, uh, Jennifer Harberry. And Jennifer met her there and said, I will walk with you. You deserve asylum. So she walked her across, went into the same office. The Border Patrol officer was sent to send her away again. And uh, Jennifer said, not over my dead body. She is getting into this country. She deserves. I'm an attorney. I am representing her. She needs to be let in. So they almost dragged Jennifer out bodily, but she screamed and yelled and called D.C. and called folks up here. And they allowed 
Honest Alley to come into this country. But what they did is they came into the country and put her into detention center, which is a gym. 30 minutes from us is South Pottery Island Detention Center. They sent Otiselli there. And there, because it's a jail, because it's like large institutions, there's a lot of staff infection. And so before long, Otiselli kept contracting cellulitis in different places, but then she contracted and had cellulitis over her wound. She kept going to the uh, medical care there, which are great for screening, but not for chronic care. And so she kept going back, and they actually uh, were giving her uh, inappropriate medication for what she had. Uh, Jennifer called me, so this is some time later. Jennifer's a good friend of mine. Jennifer called me, and she's like, Marsha, I'm really worried because Otiselli's uh, wound looks really bad, and it's really red, and it's really oozing, and she said she's supposed to have it dressed and changed twice a day, but she doesn't have any supplies. They won't do it at the clinic. And so she's resorting to using sanitary pads and putting that on her wound under her under her underwear and her sheets are changed once a week and she has pus all over her sheets. And I'm really worried that she's getting sick. And I said, well, you know, if you can get her medical chart, I'll review it. And so uh, Jennifer can do that as the attorney. And she's like, I'm really worried, and she's getting sick, and now I think she has a fever. She's got chills, and she has a fever. I'm like, okay, we'll really get that medical chart. So I got the medical chart. It was 500 pages long. Uh, you know, for all your residents, in the, who are the residents? Major Okay. Are there any medical students? No. Okay. Uh, re it's 500 pages, but as a resident, you learn pretty quick how to flip through 500 pages, and which ones are important and which ones aren't. And it was fairly certain, fairly obvious, very soon, that she had been getting substandard care. And then I was lacking the last six weeks. I didn't know what happened uh, the last six weeks before Jennifer came to me and she saw me to the clinic. I said, you got to go back and get the other. And so I went through this, and this is what they were giving her. They started for cellulitis. They gave her Keflex. She gave her Keflex. And then they gave her Moxicillin. That didn't work very well. So then they went to augmented. That didn't work very well. And then they, they tried a little bit of Bactrim, but not a whole regimen. And then they went to a fluoroquinolone, but she never got any IV antibiotics. And in all their notes, it notes that she has pins and plates right underneath this, that this is near her So she brought in the next uh, batch of uh, the next day. And I read through those. And she had finally gotten to a wound um, doctor, and the wound doctor finally did an uh, x-ray and uh, said she had chronic osteomyelitis, and she was going to have to have a surgery soon to clean this whole thing up. And But now she's got fevers and chills. And so uh, this was at 9 o'clock at night, and so I turned to Jennifer after I read those, and I said, she needs to get out tonight. We need to get her out of there so we can get her to detention out of detention into, into a hospital and get her real care. They've set up a, a surgery for her a month from now, and she still hasn't gotten IV anymore. And so um, so she went on into high gear. She called everybody up here and across the world, and I wanted to practically jettison out of her out of there the next day. But while they're in, and Dr. Meyerstein is in the back of the room, and he works with ORR, he's fabulous medical director there with them, and he works with y'all, too. While she was in uh, the facility, she was going to get good medical care. She was going to not get good. She wasn't getting standard care. But she had coverage. And if she was going to be released, we had nothing. And so luckily, she was going to California. And we were able, through an organization called Migrant Clinician Network, to get her to talk uh, all try to explain afterwards probably because because of all the stuff to talk to and I want you to be able to ask questions. They were able to talk to the hospital in Oakland, Oakland Highland, who is very immigrant friendly, and they accepted her. We raised money that day for Jennifer, her attorney, and Adeseli to fly as soon as they released her. But I said, you need to bring her to my house before I take you to the airport 
because I need to lay eyes on her and make sure she's not accepted. And so we need to get her quick. The hospital is ready to accept her. And she came in and she couldn't walk. We had to carry her in and carry her back. And they got a wheelchair. She got to Oakland uh, in the middle of the night. My condition was calling all night. People were texting and the ER people. And the next morning I got and I sent a, the seven, 600 pages and I put it in like you residents do into a summary of what had happened to her with pertinent, pertinent positives and negatives and no labs that were ever drawn on the balloon. And sent that with her and put my cell phone at the bottom and said, call me with any questions. The orthopedic trauma surgeon texted me the other day, I mean that next morning, and said, can I call you? This is Dr. So-and-so. Well, I don't know if any of y'all have the orthopedic trauma surgeon call you and want to check in with you after you referred them to them. And so I said, sure. And um, he said, I've got your patient. Thank you for this summary. It was very succinct. Thank you for sending the whole record. We are all here going to take care of her. She's 31 years old. She's not going to lose her leg. She's not going to lose her life, not as long as she's here. She needs three surgeries, and we're going to get it for her. And they did. And Adesali met her family. Her family came to the hospital and brought her food from the home country. Uh, she was healing. And those are stories that happen all the time. Not in ORR. ORR has physicians who are following up on these children and getting them released and getting them care. But in adults and in family detention, that is not necessarily the case. So what is happening on the border? So I bet this isn't touch screen. I'm not really sure. Touch Do you know how to... Yeah. Oh, there you go. The link. It's right here. No. Oh, you go back. <coughs> <coughs> How many heard this last summer? These are the children inside the Southern Border Patrol Processing Center where I live. Um, and this is a girl who had been separated from her mother. And it goes on. And ProPublica was able to get this because a worker inside the Processing Center um, was brave enough and risk her life really and her job, she recorded the cries of the children. And this one girl repeating, call my aunt, call my aunt, I have her number. And she had memorized the number. The girl was like six. And please call my aunt, where is my mama? My aunt will take care of me. And she's crying and crying. I think this changed the consciousness of our country when they heard that it actually was happening and to hear the fear and distress of children being ripped from their parents. And they were really ripped. The parents were told untruths. They would say, uh, you can go shower now or you can go meet with an agent and get processed and we'll keep your child here. And then they would take them away. Or they would say, we're going to take them for a bath. Well, first of all, the mother should have given a bath, not somebody else. And so this was going on on the border. Um, this has been going on for years. It just wasn't a policy, the zero tolerance that the, that the uh, government was proud of. So they have been doing it forever. And recently um, they notified that they've been doing it as a pilot project in El Paso since 2017. So that was part of the ACLU's uh, lawsuit that got included in the children that had to be reunited. Uh, I'm sorry, the other one, the other uh, document report that I showed you was from Doctors Without Borders. This is one, Betraying Family Values, that, talk, that is a document reporting the separation of families at the border that have been going on for years, and they still have been going on. This is a scene from last year. So when the children were being separated, 
the parents, and so this is any family who came across the river, but remember they weren't accepting any families in across the bridges. So they're illegal. So this is Molly Crabapple, is a, a fabulous artist who came to the border, and she's a sketch artist, and so she was at the bus station, she was in immigration court, she was everywhere. So she spent uh, about two weeks down there really documenting in pictures what was going on. These were the immigration courts. So the immigration courts were packed with these parents that had been separated from the kids. And you would see them this thing this day. There were 75 in the courtroom. And they call your A number, which is like your number that would have been tattooed on your arm, but it's your alien number that has been given to you for your case. And so they would call them and they would prosecute them in mass. So they would do the whole thing in mass. You didn't have your own day in court. And so they would spend they would call your name, call your name out, and then they would say, How do you how do you plead? And you would see over and over and over again them say culpable, 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 which means guilty. And this one father had the courage to stand up and say, I don't know where my child is. And his, uh, the, the uh, friend of the court attorney that was there that day ran over to him and said, Sir, please don't say that because if we can get out of here, just plead guilty, I may be able to get you back so you can get with your child before they take him away. So he pled culpable. What you don't see in this picture, now these people have, have committed a misdemeanor. This is what you don't see. They come in in handcuffs and shackles, chains and shackles around their ankles. So you can hear them coming for a misdemeanor. Then they are placed, uh, if they are released and allowed to go north, many of these were not. They were put in detention or deported. Uh, this is um, what is called an ankle monitor. Some people call them ankle braces. I wouldn't call them that. I would call them an ankle, um, a modern, modern day shackle. It's an electronic shackle. You have to plug it in and charge it up for hours a day. It is as if you are a sex crime offender and have been released into the public. So it's very humiliating. Um, I go to immigration court um, probably six or eight times a year for juveniles. This is a scene she depicted of that. This, uh, the woman on the, on the left is uh, a friend of the court. They don't actually have representation, but it's a friend of the court. And this is a boy from Guatemala who only speaks teaching. And uh, it is... Uh, it is seldom that I leave juvenile court without going home and weeping because the vulnerability and the utter, utter aloneness that these children are going through, despite the fact that they may come in with 12 and they, they elbow each other and stuff while they're sitting there. They don't understand everything. And if you're sitting behind them in the bench, I need to always been there, they're, their legs are going like this, or their hands are going like this. And they may smile, or they may do something, but they're going like this. Uh, this is Molly. The guards told her she couldn't come in and draw any more pictures. And so she said, okay, I won't. And so she just started taking notes. <laughs> and pretty soon, that is the scene in the juvenile court that day. And her notes, I mean, and so this was published in the Rolling Stone. Her notes, uh, you know, actually name like Miriam Aguaya and others who were in the room as friends of the court attorneys, and they were very proud to see their names there that day. This is the Border Wall. Um, these bridges, these um, fences are often there. They're makeshift. There's people in Mexico that will actually uh, build them and sell them to the immigrants, so it's kind of an underground, you know, market, like market, but it has become a, uh, a sacred uh, piece of uh, memorabilia, almost. Uh, Mike found, when he was taking the ACL donors to the river to see some of this, he found one of these uh, ladders, and it was almost all washed away and um, uh, decayed, whatever it rotted, and it was held together with men's uh, leather belts. And he, 
he brought it home. He put it on the van. He brought it home, and he said, I don't know what. We're going to do this. I just had to take it. And we let it outside to dry, and I said, I know what we're going to do with this. And this hangs in our living room above uh, a, a tapestry from Mongolia that was a gift. But it hangs there, and to me and to our family and the people who come in, it suddenly made our space even more sacred. And so it's an uh, honor to have it hanging on the wall. Now, activists and other people who come to visit are often looking for the, the, um, the uh, what do you call them? Ladders. I thought I say bridges. The ladders so that they can take them, they make them into art and chairs. And uh, the Border Patrol started, like, uh, chainsawing them apart so people couldn't do that. This is what it looks like if you're crossing the river. This is the Border Patrol coming across. Um, there is no oversight. Let me say that the Border Patrol is a very complicated organization, and it pays some of the highest salaries in our area, and it has some of our finest boys and girls, men and women, working for them. They pay over $75,000 as an entry job. And so there's only a few that are bad apples, and they're trying to follow the law and provide security. They will say, we don't want to take care of children. We want to go after the bad guys. We don't want to keep children. So we and the AP and others are advocating to get them away. That if it's a family or a child, put them in another place with child-friendly um, workers who've been trained in children, and you can have Border Patrol there to process, but don't put them in cages. This is our neighborhood. It's what it looks like. They're on horseback. They're on bicycles. They're in trucks. This is our region of the border. There's only two roads going north, um, so uh, those two highways. There's a checkpoint uh, up about 100 miles from us. And what that means for our families in our region is that uh, if you have a, a child that's born in our area that has a problem, and they need to go to Houston or San Antonio or somewhere for a higher level of care that in the past we haven't had, you couldn't get past that as an adult, as their parent. So you would have to send them with somebody else, not you take them. So I've had to fly kids over this checkpoint by air transport rather than send them in an ambulance so that we could get them to the care they needed. Um, Dr. Glenn Medellin in San Antonio tells the story of a preemie coming from Laredo that had a bad um, congenital anomaly when it was born, and they, the people in Laredo had given up and said, well, send you to San Antonio where they can maybe help you. He is a uh, complex care uh, doc, and he also is palliative care. So he went to the ICU to see this baby, and the residents were arguing, uh, we're not arguing, but discussing, well, this baby is obviously going to die, and what we need to know, should we... FaceTime or Skype so the parents are here and can experience it. And he was aghast that they were even thinking about this. And he said, no, we are going to keep this baby alive and fly her back to her parents so she can die in their arms with them. She should never have been transported here. And so never do this. Uh, this is uh, in November of 2016 when the AAP president came down, and we went into the Border Patrol Processing Center that's been cited as the worst. And there were 700 kids in there that day. It was all deathly quiet. Um, all these children were lying on the floor, on the concrete floor, in cages. It's cold. And this is what they're given to cover up with. That's it, on the floor. And there were 700 of them in the cages that day, and they were not asleep and there was not a word, except the rustling of those blankets. And as 13 pediatricians walked in, we had never seen 700 kids completely quiet in the middle of the day, awake under these things. And it was obviously bad. We had mounds of teddy bears and security blankets that had been taken from them because of uh, fear of babies. This is what it looked like. The lights are on 24 hours a day. It's cold. They're humiliated. 
Often the food is thrown on the ground. It is frozen burritos or frozen white bread uh, ham sandwiches. Uh, there are people in there who are good, and there are brothers and sisters, and they contract with people also outside of the Customs and Border Patrol, and none of them have any training in pediatrics or in taking care of children. Uh, we took them into the facility, the pediatrician and the president, so that we could prepare them for this policy statement that we were writing. Dr. Julie Linden and Alan Shapiro and I were asked to write the policy statement for the AAP, which really informs what they can do and advocate for as the academy. They have to all the executive board and multiple committees had to approve this policy statement. So we brought them to the border to see exactly what detention looked like. Um, in 2017, I took back, uh, back in there uh, positions from Texas Children's Hospital, and there uh, we went in and we did, before we went in, and Border Patrol gives you this great presentation of all the things they do and the drugs they stop on the bridges and how they're creating secure borders. I don't know what that means. What does this mean? Push the decline, like there? No. Okay. Hang on, I'll get it. Thank you, sir. Okay. And so we listen, we watch the video, and then we're standing on the other side of the wall, and you could hear these kids' voices, and you couldn't tell if they were playing or what was going on, but you could hear all these voices. And we walk through the door, and right there where that, where that, that desk thing is was a cage with about 40 10-year-old boys, about 40 and about 10 years old. And they were all screaming and sobbing for their mothers, which were on this side of the wall, who were in identical cages. And they were screaming, Mama, Mama. And they were reaching through the chain link fence trying to reach their mothers, one little boy had slumped against the wall and was trying to control his sobs, like trying to get control of himself. And the physicians went, wait, 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 where's child life? You know, why don't you have somebody in here explaining to these boys? And they said, no, 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 you don't understand. If one of them starts crying, they all start crying. This is nothing. Just ignore it. And um, we, we don't ignore our kids crying. Uh, let's see. Now it doesn't want to go. Okay. Kathy, I'm not sure what happened. And I'm going to race through the rest of it. Yeah? Okay. What happens after processing centers? After they're processed, the processing center you saw is called uh, Daguilera and Pereira because it's uh, dog kennels is what they call them. Uh, the adults can be separated and sent to adult detention centers or they can be uh, sent to family detention centers. There's two in Texas, it's Dilly and Carnes. Uh, they can be sent to ORR if they're unaccompanied and alone uh, or they can be deported. Um, or there are some lucky families that are released to the bus stations to find their way home. Uh, their families have to buy their bus tickets, so what we do is we work with the Border Patrol, and now they are dropping their families at the rest of the center. So I work at, uh, I don't know if it's right here, the Humanitarian Rest of Center as a volunteer organizing the medical uh, volunteers who come down and in the community to provide care for the families who are there. And they get a meal, a hot meal, a warm shower, uh, they get clothes for the trip. They uh, get food for the trip. And, uh, and so uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about at the end really, really fast. At ORR, here's the information. There's over 100 sites in 11 states, approximately, approximately 5,600 beds are in Texas and around 2,500 in my area, which I've been uh, uh, honored to be able to go into these facilities and work with the people who are doing the very best they can. There's a lot of bad press about the ORR. You want your child at an ORR facility. You don't want them in a family detention facility or a processing center. So none of us are perfect. 
there's always going to be something, but these people are trying their best. Uh, this is what happened last year. So because they were backed up and because the administration was putting in new guidelines uh, to have everybody in the household fingerprinted, you see the blue bar is the number of kids in ORR detention. And the black line is the normal amount that are the total number of unaccompanied children apprehended at the border who turn themselves in. So that number did not really increase. But you see how the, the children in detention uh, that were being held, it went from normal length of stay of 30 days to 60 days because of the fingerprint. They relaxed that rule. So in December, you see it fall, and 4,000 children were reunited with their families uh, and released. Uh, I've been in Tornillo. This is the 10th city in El Paso. Um, it's now closed. And uh, that's a good thing. It was a great facility with lots of recreation and amenities. But the children thought when they got there that they were going to meet their families very quickly. They hurried them away in the middle of the night, and they traveled, many of them, 10 hours or more to here. They stayed there, but they thought they were going to be released within three weeks. And many of them were there uh, up to four months or over. And they were losing hope. One girl said, the girls in this, this is like a girl's bedroom or tent, that they cry themselves at sleep at night because they're not, they're not allowed to hug each other or touch each other. And so you would hear a girl crying themselves to sleep, and even the chaperones wouldn't touch them or comfort them. And I asked her how she got through that. And she said, I don't cry anymore. I'm not sad anymore. I'm not angry anymore. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. We are crushing the life and heart of these kids up when they can't get out and they have no idea about their future. It's completely uncertain for these children. And so we are working to make sure we get these processed in the best child-friendly way and get these kids out. This is Dilly. I also wrote a letter and got another child out that was suicidal here, not because of anything she has had trauma in her home country and trauma on the trip, but it was because of the treatment in Delhi, and uh, uh, she couldn't get out, and she eventually started cutting herself, and then she tried to kill herself and she twice, and we were able to get a safety plan and get her out into the community and get her released in 24 hours. This is the rest of the center. This is where I work. This is where families, the lucky ones, get released. We are seeing 500 a day. That's 500 a day. And we try to get them on the buses. Another 500 comes in tomorrow. And 500, and they're coming to you. I have sent necrotizing fasciitis to Falls Church, Virginia. I have sent kids with uh, cancer to Virginia or D.C. I'm connecting them from all over to come to you. Most of these are healthy. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just trying to get their family. Uh, but we are on call for them and managing the medical providers that are volunteering to give over-the-counter medicine. We are trying to raise funds to be able to have full-time staff that can be there every day to have really good medical care because otherwise the same thing that happened to Border Patrol with a, a child that died after they left could happen with us. Because if we don't have quality people looking at those children, as they're leaving to make sure and have a presence, then that's scary. That's scary, and it should not happen. Um, these are some of the initiatives people are doing. Everybody is starting to train in trauma-informed clinics. The ACLU started border uh, port and port watches, where they have volunteers from the community, uh, retirees that go there, and they watch just to document and bear witness of any laws that are being broken and to make sure immigrants are being treated correctly. The most, probably one of the most exciting is the Angry Kids and the Abuelas Respondents, and they are all over the country. And what they do, they're a crazy, complicated group, but uh, they learn the bus routes out of our area. And what they've done is they not only have women at the bus stop giving support, but they've contacted friends in Houston, in New Orleans, in Memphis, 
all the way to New York, and the same on the West Coast. There's one in a group in Salisbury, Maryland, that is meeting people at the bus stop and making sure they've got everything they need. Is anybody sick? Do you need some food? Do you need some resources? Country is standing up for these families, and so it's very heartwarming to me. Local and national collaboration, I'm sorry, I'm just now getting to that. We're working on it. We have the DC chapter is like my hero. I mean, they have created the best online website that uh, connects people with resources. The rest of the country is trying to do this. The Immigrant Health Sick, if you're not uh, a member, please join the Council of Community Pediatrics and join the Immigrant SIG, where you can stay up to date and advocate with us. Uh, come to the Humanitarian Respite Center. Uh, we started medical review for immigrants, which is volunteer doctors, many of you do it as well, who will um, respond to a pro bono immigration attorney if they call and say, I've got a child or an adult that's in this and I think they could die or lose their leg or, or kill themselves. These doctors will review the medical charts for these pro bono immigration attorneys and turn around the letter within 24 hours to hopefully get them released so they can get standard of care. Um, I leave you with this. Um, this is Janusz Borczak, probably all of you know him. He was a pediatrician in Warsaw. He started an orphanage. He was like Dr. Spock, or I don't know who it would be today. He was well read, he wrote children's stories, and he wrote lots of books. But mostly, he started this orphanage to take care of children. And really, our rights of the child, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, was based on this man's book rule that he had in the orphanage that the children got to decide that they had rights. And when they came for the children to take them away on the train to the gas chamber, he had been offered multiple times to get free, that people would get him out of the country and let him be free. And he said no and no. And the day they came for the children, he said, now I will leave you my And he carried them and he walked with over 200 children from the orphanage to the box car. We have a similar crisis, and we have children that are being deported back to their death, or families that are being detained and have bad outcomes. And to me, it's like this is my life, it's my passion and my mission. But I think uh, to be silent in this time is, in many ways, to be complicit. And as pediatricians, we need all our voices. So thank you.